Hi guys, this is Dr. A. We're going to look at chemistry basics. We're going to cover the liver. So the liver is the largest solid organ in the human body. It is located in uh, the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. The functions of the liver include um, they have a major role in the metabolism of fat, carbohydrates, and protein. Um, they are, it is involved in bilirubin metabolism and bile production, and it has a big role in detoxification and excretion of a variety of endogenous uh, meaning produced by the body and exogenous meaning absorbed by the intestines um, substances. And so uh, it process, it's a big factory, big processing plant. That's basically what the liver is. Um, and it can be affected by many systemic diseases. LFTs, or liver function tests, are a panel of lab tests that is used to measure liver function or hepatic biliary inflammation. The panel generally includes the following test, an ALT, the alanine aminotransferase, an AST, the aspartate aminotransferase, the alkaline phosphatase, and then at least the albumin, but usually the total protein and the albumin level and the total bilirubin. Um, the test um, most often used to assess the protein, the synthetic function of the liver are going to be the albumin and then the prothrombin time. So the liver is a big protein factory and it manufactures the majority of the proteins in your body. Pretty much the only one that's made outside of the liver are the antibodies that are made by white cells. And so, uh, and half of the proteins floating around in your blood are you know, albumin. And so, um, albumin and then prothrombin time, um, the other, the proteins that are involved there are all the clotting factors. Uh, so, liver makes the clotting factors transport proteins, albumin, etc. And so if uh, those things become decreased, there's low albumin and then an increased prothrombin time because of the low amount of uh, clotting factors, then uh, we can suspect that uh, the liver is having problem um, manufacturing those things. So let's start with the albumin. The normal range is 3.5 to 5.0 grams per deciliter. So that is quite a bit because we're measuring it in grams per deciliter. Um, and it does reflect the liver's synthetic ability. So it's ability to manufacture protein, especially albumin. Uh, and so the concentration of albumin could remain normal in many liver diseases as long as liver function is preserved. And so the liver being such an essential organ, um, it has capacity to renew itself, to heal itself. And so it will the body will try to preserve liver function for as long as possible. But as the liver is damaged and the synthetic capabilities are impaired, then albumin will progressively decline. It is commonly decreased in patients with chronic liver disorders, such as cirrhosis, and it usually reflects severe liver damage. Uh, low concentrations of albumin are associated with ascites, which is um, the accumulation of fluid in the abdominal area, and also with a poor prognosis, meaning not a good outcome. Hypoalbuminemia, that would be low albumin levels in the blood. So um, with that, patients can develop peripheral edema, ascites, and pulmonary edema. So that is fluid retention in all of the places. So in the legs, that would be peripheral edema. In the abdomen, that would be ascites. Around the lungs, that would be pulmonary edema. Why is that? Is because one of the roles of albumin in the body is to hold water in the circulation. And um, if there's not enough of that, uh, it won't be able to hold on to the water into the circulation, so into the uh, cardiovascular system into the veins and arteries and that water will actually go into the tissues and so you get edema. Uh, so low levels of albumin will also affect the interpretation of serum calcium concentration in uh, of any drugs that are highly protein bound. So one of the jobs of albumin other than holding water in place in the cardiovascular system is to transport things uh, and um, calcium is one of them, uh, drugs, protein-bound drugs is another. Hyperalbuminemia, high levels of albumin in the blood, that one is a lot more rarer of a finding. It is seen in patients that have marked dehydration 
and they are always associated with an elevated BUN and hematocrit, which are all reflective of severe dehydration. And so it's not that the liver is producing more albumin, it's producing the same amount, but there's been a loss of water making it more concentrated in the blood and so appearing to be increased. Um, doesn't cause any symptoms or findings because again, the liver is not going to manufacture more. They'll, manufa they'll manufacture the correct amount. It's just a dehydration. Um, if you see high albumin levels, you pretty much need to think marked dehydration. Um, patients that are on heparin or ampicillin could have falsely elevated albumin results. Next is pre-albumin. So pre-albumin is not part of the LFTs, but it is also a marker of the synthetic um, function of the liver. A normal range for pre-albumin is 16 to 40 milligrams per deciliter. The other name for pre-albumin is transthyretin. Uh, it is decreased in severe liver disease, pregnancy, burns, and protein malnutrition. Um, this one is used mostly to assess malnutrition and uh, maybe also liver synthetic capacity. So it changes and responds more, more quickly to changes than albumin. So um, it would decrease before albumin decreases in liver disease, but if um, an elderly patient is suffering from protein malnutrition because they're not eating, the pre-albumin will be decreased um, way sooner than the albumin would be decreased. Um, and so um, it is um, essentially used for um, assessment of protein nutrition, and um, that is its main role. Globulin, um, so globulin is the um, other half of, if you will, the protein. So we said like about half the proteins in the body are going to be albumin. The other half is globulin. There are alpha, beta, and gamma globulins. Your gamma globulins, you know, as your antibodies. And a lot of the alpha and beta globulins tend to uh, function as transport proteins in the blood. Normal range for globulin is going to be 2 to 3 grams per deciliter. Um, causes of low concentrations will include immunodeficiency syndrome. Obviously, then you're not just not producing enough antibodies, right? Protein malnutrition, not getting enough proteins to make those globulins. Malabsorption, so having problems absorbing the amino acids so that proteins can be made. So there would be GI symptoms, uh, GI problems. And protein losing enteropathy, um, again, a GI problem where protein is lost through the GI system. Causes of elevated concentration will include inflammation, and it can be present in hepatitis, especially in chronic viral and autoimmune hepatitis, because you would have an increased amount of antibodies. So anything that would up the antibody production can up your globulin reading. Then the total protein, the normal range will be 5.5 to 8.3 grams per deciliter, and it primarily reflects the sum of albumin and globulins. So you take all the albumins, all the globulins, add them together. That's pretty much all the proteins in your body. Um, not really counting fibrinogen, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty accurate. So the value of obtaining a total protein concentration is limited if um, the albumin and globulin levels are already known. Um, if your albumin decreases significantly, then the total protein will de de decrease as well because half of the total protein is albumin. Um, and so we would be, in the context of liver disease, we would be concerned if the total protein would drop. And uh, because then, you know, and you should know that because then the albumin should be low also. The total bilirubin, the normal range is 0 0.3 to 1.0 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, the total bilirubin is the sum of direct and indirect bilirubin uh, that are also known as conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Direct and indirect has to do with how it's measured. Um, so what happens to bilirubin? Bilirubin is from the breakdown of red cells. When the red cells break down, the bilirubin um, it comes from the heme portion of the hemoglobin that is being um, destroyed and recycled. The bilirubin is lipid soluble, and um, so it has to be transported on albumin and taken to the liver, and the liver um, has to conjugate it by glucuronidation to um, make it into a water-soluble form that can be excreted in bowel. And so the, um, 
conjugated bilirubin is the bilirubin that has been made water soluble and that's the conjugation process makes it water soluble and the unconjugated bilirubin is the one that is lipid soluble and it can cause damage um, if it can accumulate in the brain and things like that. So uh, with total bilirubin we are concerned with high levels so uh, high levels would be hyperbilirubinemia um, and when there is um, high levels of bilirubin in the blood, you will see jaundice or what we call icterus, which is a yellowish color of the skin and the whites of the eyes. It is usually best to assess that in the white of the eyes because, um, you know, skin tones vary in humans, but everybody has white um, eyeballs. And so um, it is a good way to assess um, icteria or jaundice. Uh, jaundice usually becomes visible when the total bilirubin concentration is 2 to 4 milligrams per deciliter. So that's 2 to 4 times the upper limit of normal. AST, ALT, and Ocklin phosphatase. So we covered those in the enzyme video, but we're going to look at them again. So both AST and ALT can be elevated in what we call hepatocellular injury, so liver cell injury. Um, and this is where you will see toxic hepatitis, viral hepatitis, hepatic carcinoma. So the damage is actually happening to the hepatocytes, to the liver cells, the, the cells that carry out the function of the liver. Okay. If only the AST is increased, then its increase could be not from the liver. So you need to think outside the liver, maybe muscle, red cells, other things that could increase AST. But if both AST and LT are elevated, especially proportionally, like in the same amount, um, then definitely need to think liver, liver injury. The alkaline phosphatase is going to be elevated in hepatobiliary obstruction. So anything that either damages or um, blocks the bile duct is because alkaline phosphatase is contained in the cells that line the bile ducts. Uh, so gallstones. Um, also alkaline phosphatase, as we mentioned, is increased in bone diseases and pregnancy. Uh, and so taking all of that together, then we can see if uh, these enzyme elevations reflect liver damage or something else. Um, a pretty typical um, increase in uh, cause of increase in alkaline phosphatase uh, is going to be gallstones. And ammonia, the normal range for ammonia is 30 to 70 micrograms per deciliter. It is not part of the liver function test, but it is often ordered in the context of uh, liver damage and liver injuries. Uh, ammonia comes from the large intestine where it is formed by the bacterial catabolism of protein. And uh, liver disease can interfere with the normal removal of ammonia from blood. And the accumulation of ammonia and other toxins uh, can cause deterioration of mental function. And so that can you know, range from subtle changes and confusion to complete coma. So uh, if a patient's having some issues with their liver and there's a mental status change, then one should assess their ammonia levels. Um, levels of ammonia can also be elevated in Rye syndrome, inborn disorders of the urea cycle, rare pediatric metabolic disorders, various medications, impaired renal function, and utero endoscopy or uh, even UTIs. So, okay. It's a good one to assess, again, when there's mental status change in the context of liver disease or uh, problems with the liver. All right, that wraps it up for the liver. Thank you.